Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. Um, today, it's my great pleasure to tell you about our work on genetic risk factors shared by multiple distinct autoimmune diseases. I joined ICGEB in September last year, so my lab just turned one year old. Um, here are the current members of my group. It's been my great pleasure working with them and being a member of the uh, global ICGEB family. The overarching goals of our lab is first to elucidate the molecular networks underlying autoimmune response and the specific clinical traits of autoimmune disease in humans. Next, we will leverage the new insights gained from this line of basic research to develop better preventive and therapeutic strategies for autoimmune disease, such as developing new biomarkers, biologics, and diagnostic kits. Autoimmune diseases are a group of related diseases where one's immune system um, uh, attacks and damages one's own tissues. And worldwide, approximately 4% of the population is affected with an autoimmune disease. And most of the autoimmune diseases are chronic diseases, and sometimes uh, these diseases are fatal to the patients. So um, obviously, uh, autoimmune diseases have a big impact on the healthcare system. And currently, we urgently need better treatment for autoimmune diseases. Genetic, both genetic factors and environmental factors contribute to autoimmune diseases in humans. And unlike Mendelian diseases, autoimmune diseases are complex diseases involving many different risk factors. However, we know very little about the identity and the mechanism of um, the genetic risk factors and environmental factors that cause autoimmune disease in humans. Furthermore, we know very little about the interactions between different genetic risk factors the interactions between different environmental factors and the interactions between genetic and environmental risk factors. It is hard to systematically study environmental factors. In contrast, genetic factors are well-defined, hence are easier to study. For example, we can probe the entire human genome in a systematic way. Genetics offers a bag of tools that can help us identify genetic risk factors for autoimmune diseases, as well as other complex diseases. And some genetic approaches take advantage of genetic variants that naturally occur in human populations. Therefore, we have been applying genetic approaches, as well as other approaches, to better understand the genetic basis and the pathogenesis of autoimmune disease in humans. Our research will lead to a better understanding of the disease mechanism and ultimately better health care for patients. So genome-wide association study, GWAS, is a genetic method that identifies chromosomal regions that are associated with a common disease. Here is a, um, an example of a typical Manhattan plot generated by GWAS. On the x-axis are chromosomes 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth. And the y-axis uh, represents p-value, p-values on the minus log 10 scale. And each dot on this plot represents one single nucleotide polymorphism, SNP. And the SNPs that are above this blue line are considered statistically significant because these SNPs have very small p-values. Their p-values are uh, smaller than 10 to the minus, minus 8. So these um, SNPs are considered to be associated with the disease under study. So GWAS have been conducted for most of the common autoimmune diseases in humans. Next, to further uh, fine map the risk loci identified by GWAS, the research community developed and utilized the immunochip SNP array. Immunochip is a custom-made dense genotyping chip containing approximately 200,000 SNPs. And these SNPs were carefully chosen. Um, all of these SNPs are located in 186 loci, which were previously identified by GWAS as being associated with an auto, uh, autoimmune disease or other uh, immune-mediated diseases. 
So GWAS and immunochip bind mapping studies have identified more than 50 risk loci for each common autoimmune disease. So this is a remarkable advancement in our understanding of the uh, genetic basis of autoimmune disease. However, we are still faced with several major challenges. So first of all, uh, association is not the same as causation. GWAS and bi mapping studies tell us about disease association, but not causation. So in fact, the exact genes and variants that cause autoimmune diseases in humans are still largely unknown. This is because most of the autoimmune risk loci are in non-coding regions of the human genome, which have no obvious biological or regulatory function. Another reason is uh, linkage disequilibrium within uh, risk loci. Oftentimes, uh, in one disease-associated uh, risk locus, there are many SNPs. Uh, these SNPs are highly correlated with each other as a result of linkage disequilibrium. So as a result, it is extremely hard to pinpoint the exact SNPs that are responsible for the disease association in, in a given uh, risk locus. So we need to identify causative genes and the variants for autoimmune disease and to elucidate their mechanisms of action. Another major challenge is that uh, we know very little about the interactions between various genetic risk factors. So this is because uh, most prior studies uh, focused on uh, the individual effect of a single gene or a single variant. So we lack a holistic understanding of the disease. So how do various uh, genetic risk factors act jointly in the development of autoimmune disease? This is an important question that still awaits further investigation. So to address these major challenges, we have been focusing on shared risk factors for autoimmune diseases. So indeed, the genetic studies have revealed that different autoimmune diseases actually share certain common risk factors. And most of these shared risk factors are involved in the immune system. It is important for us to better understand the function and mechanism of these shared risk factors because they can lead us to key biological pathways underlying autoimmunity, as well as novel drug targets that can be utilized uh, to treat multiple diseases, autoimmune diseases, at the same time. So one example of such shared risk factors for autoimmune disease is UBASH3A. UBASH3A is expressed primarily in T cells of the adaptive immune system. And, you, uh, and the SNPs in or near the UBASH3A gene has been shown to be associated with seven different autoimmune diseases as shown here in the gray box. However, at the time uh, when we started working on UBASH3A, the function of UBASH3A in human T cells was unknown because at that time, most of the data on UBASH3A came from mouse studies. Furthermore, we knew nothing about the mechanism whereby UBASH3A contributes to autoimmune diseases. So we set out to answer these uh, important questions. At, at the time uh, in the literature, it was known that UBASH3A has three structural domains based on sequence homology, and they are the N-terminal ubiquitin-associated UBA domain, uh, the SH3 domain, and a C-terminal histidine phosphatase domain, which is also known as the PGM domain. In addition, UBASH3A can be ubiquitinated, and UBASH3A has four ubiquitination sites. The K202 site is the major ubiquitination site on UBASH3A. So to understand the function of UBASH3A in human T cells, we used the CRISPR uh, and the knocked out UBASH3A in jerked cells, which are a commonly used human T cell line. And then we performed the limiting dilution and obtained single cell clones. We got two UBASH3 knockout clones. So here in this experiment, we IP'd with one anti-UBASH3 antibody, followed by immunoglobulin with a different anti-UBASH3 antibody. So in the jerked lane, we can see the unmodified version of the UBASH3A protein indicated by the black arrowhead. 
In addition, we can see the mono-ubiquitinated form of UBASH3A indicated by the asterisk. So this is a UBASH3A with one ubiquitin molecule attached to it. And in contrast, no UBASH3A proteins were detected in either of the UBASH3A knockout clones. So this confirms that our CRISPR knockout was successful. So next, we set out to uh, characterize and phenotype our uh, knockout clones. So T cells express the T cell receptor CD3 complex, TCR-CD3 complex, on its plasma membrane. And when this complex is engaged, a cascade of signaling events are triggered in T cells, leading to T cell uh, pr uh, proliferation and activation. And activated T cells produce um, many different kinds of cytokines, including IL-2. IL-2 is very important because it is required for T cell survival and function. So we looked at the relationship between UBASH3A and IL-2. We stimulated JERCA cells and the UBASH3A knockout cells with anti-CD3 antibody. And then we measured IL-2 secretion by ELISA. Here is the result. As we can see here, the two UBASH3A knockout clones secreted significantly more IL-2 than the parental jerk cells upon stimulation. And the fold changes here are quite big. So this finding is significant because at the time, according to the literature, there was no connection between UBASH3A and IL-2, which is a very important cytokine. So we followed up on this initial exciting uh, finding. So we generated three different jerkhead-derived overexpressing clones. These clones overexpress V5-tagged UBASH3A protein. As we can see here, the C3 clone had less V5-tagged exogenous UBASH3A than the C1 and C2 clones. And we subjected these uh, clones to the IL-2 ELISA assay. Here is the result. All of these uh, UBASH3 overexpressing clones secreted significantly less IL-2 than the parental jerk cells upon stimulation. Furthermore, we can see a dose effect. The C3 clone had less UBASH3A, and the C3 clone had more IL-2 secretion than the other two overexpressing clones. So these results are consistent with the findings from our UBASH3A knockout clones. Next, we looked at IL-2 transcription by qPCR. Here is the result. As we can see here, the two UBASH3A knockout clones had significantly more IL-2 transcripts than the parental jerk cells. Again, the fold changes are quite big uh, here. Next, we wanted to verify our cell line findings in human primary T cells. So we isolated CD4 T cells from healthy subjects. We stimulated the cells with anti-CD3 antibody and then performed the qPCR analysis. Here is the result. The x-axis shows the relative UBASH3A mRNA level, and the y-axis represents relative uh, IL-2 mRNA level. And each symbol on this plot represents one healthy donor. As we can see here, the um, amount of UBASH3A transcript is inversely correlated with the amount of IL-2 transcript, suggesting that UBASH3A inhibits IL-2 expression. So this is consistent with our cell line findings. So far, our data show that UBASH3A inhibits IL-2 expression, uh, transcription, and uh, secretion in T cells upon stimulation. And this finding is significant because IL-2 is a crucial cytokine um, which maintains the balance between the effector arm and the regulatory arm of the immune system. The effector arm drives up immune response, whereas the regulatory arm suppresses immune response. And IL-2 is uh, important in keeping this uh, fine balance. Furthermore, low IL-2 levels have been observed in some patients with autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, and type 1 diabetes. So low IL-2 level is a subphenotype of autoimmune diseases. Furthermore, 
IL-2 is currently being developed in clinical trials as a new therapy for autoimmune diseases. So we ask the question, how does uvac 3 inhibit IL-2 uh, expression in T cells upon stimulation? So to answer this question, we looked at the domain structure of uvac 3 Although uvac 3 has a histidine phosphatase domain based on sequence homology, uvac 3 exhibits very, very weak phosphatase activity. Therefore, we um, turn our attention to the UVA and SH3 domain of uvac 3 uh, These two domains were less studied at the time, and their functions were less um, understood at the time. So how does uvac 3 a inhibit IL-2 expression? Well, we hypothesized that uvac 3 a does so by uh, via the ubiquitin system. So the UVA domain of uvac 3 a might bind uh, polyubiquitin chains. And it is known that certain types of polyubiquitin chains can amplify an kappa b signal transduction. And when an kappa b uh, translocates to the nucleus, it can turn on uh, gene expression, including the expression of IL-2. So to test our hypothesis, we stimulated Jerkin cells and uvac 3 a knockout cells, and then prepared uh, nuclear extracts then we measured the amount of nuclear NF kappa B P65. And here in this experiment, fibrillarin serves as a loading control. So we did quantification and statistical analysis. As we can see here, our data suggests that uvh 3 a knockout cells had significantly more nuclear NF kappa B P65 than the parental drug cells. So this confirms our hypothesis. Next, we took a closer look at the FF kappa B signaling pathway. So when T cells are activated, I mean, um, the TCR CD3 complex is engaged, the NF kappa B signaling pathway gets turned on. And when the NF kappa B signaling pathway is activated, I kappa B proteins are degraded. So in unstimulated T cells, I kappa B protein bind to uh, NF kappa B proteins, therefore, uh, sequestering NF kappa B proteins in the cytoplasm. And upon stimulation, and I kappa B proteins are degraded, thereby uh, the NF kappa B proteins can translocate to the nucleus. So here we measured the amount of I kappa B alpha in jerked cells and the uvac 3 in knockout cells at various time points upon stimulation. And again, we did quantification and statistical analysis. Our data show that uvac 3 a knockout cells had significantly less I kappa B alpha than jerky cells, both with and without simulation. So this shows that uvac 3 a deficiency accelerates uh, I kappa B alpha degradation. Then we looked at the activation of the IKK complex. So when uh, T cells are activated, uh, the NF kappa B signaling pathway gets activated the IKK complex gets phosphorylated and activated, leading to degradation of I kappa B protein. So here we uh, looked at the amount of phosphorylated IKK alpha and beta in drug cells and uvac 3 knockout cells, both with and without stimulation. We did quantification and statistical analysis, and we found that uvac 3 a knockout cells had significantly more phosphorylated IKK alpha and beta um, when the cells are stimulated. So we also looked at the upstream events along the NF kappa B signaling pathway, including the activation of PKC theta, the CBM complex, TRAF2 and 6, and TAK1. However, we did not detect any differences between the uvac 3 knockout cells and jerked cells. Therefore, uh, taken together, our data show that uvac 3 a inhibits an kappa B signaling pathway by specifically uh, inhibiting the uh, IKK complex. We also found that uvac 3 a uh, bind to lysine-63-linked ubiquitin chains, as well as methionine-1 
linked ubiquitin chains. These polyubiquitin chains are considered as non-degradative because they do not lead to protein degradation in the proteasomes. Furthermore, um, these uh, non-degradative polyubiquitin chains also bind to the IKK complex, and these ubiquitin chains uh, can amplify an alpha kappa B signal transduction. So besides the NF-kappa B signaling pathway, the proximal TCR signaling pathway triggered by the cell surface TCRCD3 uh, complex, this pathway can also lead to T-cell activation and IL-2 expression. So we looked at the relationship between UBASH3A and TCRCD3 complex. So here we did a flow cytometry analysis measuring the amount of cell surface CD3 epsilon chain which is a subunit of the TCR-CD3 complex. And here the blue curve represents uh, JERCA cells. The orange curve and the green curve are two different UBASH3A overexpressing clones. And the uh, red curve is the uh, isotype control. As we can see here, the two UBASH3A overexpressing clones had less cell surface CD3 epsilon chain than the parental JERCA cells. Furthermore, there is a dose effect. The C2 clone had more exogenous UBASH3A than the C3 clone, and the C2 clone had less cell surface CD3 epsilon. So these data suggest that UBASH3A inhibits the expression of cell surface TCR-CD3 complex, leading to a reduction in uh, proximal TCR signaling, which uh, uh, in turn lead to a decrease in IL-2 expression in T cells. So as I mentioned earlier, low IL-2 levels are observed in some patients with autoimmune diseases, including type 1 diabetes. So given um, the, uh, the effect of UBASH3A on IL-2 production, we further examined the role of UBASH3A in type 1 diabetes. T1D um, affects more than 20 million people around the world. And T1D results from the autoimmune destruction of pancreatic beta cells, which produce insulin. Like most autoimmune diseases, a T1D is heterogeneous, meaning that uh, there are considerable differences among patients with T1D in terms of their disease manifestations and response to a given treatment. In fact, the low IL-2 level is one example of the heterogeneous nature of autoimmune diseases. And this disease, because um, not all patients, autoimmune patients, exhibit the low IL-2 uh, phenotype. So this disease heterogeneity demands that patients with autoimmune diseases be treated with individualized therapy. And currently, we need um, to develop better uh, no tailored treatment for autoimmune patients uh, based on their unique genetic makeup and their unique disease manifestation clinical traits. So this is a locus zoom plot from an immunochip study on type 1 diabetes. And here we are looking at the uh, T1D risk locus on chromosome 21Q22.3. And the x-axis shows the genes located within this risk locus. And the y-axis shows the p-values on the minus log 10 scale. And every dot on this plot represents a SNP on the immunochip, uh, which were genotypes. As we can see here, the SNP RS11203203 had the smallest p-values. Uh, among all the SNPs in this region. And this SNP, RS112, is located in intron 4 of UBASH3A. So the G, uh, the major allele at RS112 is G in European populations, and the minor allele is A. And previous genetic studies have shown that the A minor allele at RS112 confers risk for type 1 diabetes. So to understand the function of RS112 in T1D, we isolated CD4 T cells from healthy subjects. 
stimulated the cells with anti-CD3 antibody, and then performed qPCR analysis. And here is the result for UBASH3A. The x-axis shows three different subject groups based on their genotype at RS112. As we can see here, T cells from the AA risk group had significantly more UBASH3A transcripts than T cells from the GG non-risk group. And here is the result for IL-2. T cells from the AA risk group had significantly less IL-2 than T cells from the GG non-risk group. So these data show that um, the A risk allele at RS112 results in elevated UBASH3 expression in T cells and hence uh, diminished IL-2 expression in T cells. So now let me summarize the first part of my talk. We set out to address two questions. What is the function of UBASH3A in human T cells? And how does UBASH3A affect risk for autoimmune diseases? And our data have shown that UBASH3A inhibits IL-2 expression and secretion in human T cells upon stimulation by suppressing the nf kappa b signaling pathway in the ubiquitin-dependent manner. In addition, we have shown that UBASH3A also inhibits the expression of cell surface TCRCD3 complexes, uh, leading to a reduction in the uh, proximal TCR signaling uh, pathway, which also uh, leads to the uh, a suppression on IL-2 expression. We also showed that uh, the risk variant at RS112 in the UBASH3A gene results in elevated UBASH3A expression and decreased uh, expression of IL-2 in human T cells upon stimulation. And this contributes to the low IL-2 phenotype of autoimmune disease. So overall, our studies have identified previously unrecognized regulators of IL-2 production and our findings can inform the design um, of future IL-2 clinical trials for autoimmune diseases. So far, I have been telling you about the individual effect of UBASH3A, which is a shared risk factor for multiple distinct autoimmune diseases. Now, in the second part of my talk, I will discuss another major challenge in the field, which is what is the interaction between various genetic risk factors for autoimmune diseases. What uh, is the joint action of these various uh, genetic risk factors in the development of the disease? So this plot shows a few examples of the um, shared risk factors, genetic risk factors, uh, across various autoimmune diseases. So uh, in the plot, the, the rows represent different autoimmune diseases, and the columns represent different genetic risk factors, including UBASH3A in column 3. And we have focused on PTPN22, as shown in column 2. As we can see here, SNPs in the PTPN22 gene have been shown to be associated with 13 different autoimmune diseases. So we chose PTPN22 for several reasons. First, both PTPN22 and UBASH3A are expressed in human T cells, and both of them um, suppress IL-2 expression and production in T cells. However, they do so by different molecular mechanisms. As I have shown, UBASH3A functions mainly as an adapter protein, and UBASH3A has like exhibits very, very weak enzymatic activity. In contrast, uh, PDBN22 functions as a tyrosine phosphatase, PDBN22 dampens the um, TCR, proximal TCR signaling pathway by dephosphorylating several key uh, stimulatory molecules of the uh, proximal TCR signaling pathway, such as uh, SAP70, VAB1, uh, LCK, etc. In addition, PDBN22 has four proline rich domains. They are called the P1, P2, P3, and P4 domains. Given these pieces of information, we ask the question, does the SH3 domain of UBASH3A interact with the proline-rich domains of PTPN22? 
To answer this question, we performed a GST pull-down assay using lysates from jerk cells and GST uh, tagged UVA, SH3, and PGM domains of UVA3A. And in this uh, experiment, GST was used as a negative control. As we can see here, the SH3 domain of UVA3A indeed pulled down PTPN22, thus confirming our hypothesis. So next, we confirmed this result by performing uh, a co-IP experiment. So we used jerk lysate, and we IP'd with anti-UVH3 antibody, and then blotted with anti-PTPN22 antibody. And this experiment showed that UVH3A did co-IP with PTPN22, suggesting that these two proteins interact with each other. Next, we looked at the RS2476601 SNP in the PTPN22 gene, because this SNP has been shown to be associated with more than 10 different autoimmune diseases in humans. And this SNP is a missense variant. The major non-risk allele at this SNP encodes an arginine at residue 620 of the PDPN22 protein. And the minor risk allele encodes a tryptophan. And uh, in the literature, this SNP is also known as the R620W SNP. And this SNP uh, is located in the P1 proline-rich domain of PTPN22. We ask uh, the question, um, does this SNP RS247 affect the interaction between the UVH3A and PTPN22 uh, proteins? So to answer this question, we performed a uh, co-transfection experiment using HAC293 T cells. And this table shows the transfection samples uh, we performed in this experiment. So we transfected the cells with a V5-tagged UVH3A construct together with a flag-tagged PTPN22 construct. For UVH3A, we used the wild-type uh, isoform and the W279A isoform. So this point mutation, the W279A mutation, um, affects the, it is located in the SH3 domain of UVH3A. Furthermore, it has been shown that this point mutation disrupts the function of the SH3 domain of UVH3A. For PDPN22, uh, we included the wild type uh, isoform and the R620W isoform encoded by the minor risk allele at the R620W SNP. And here are uh, the results from our Western blotting. And these blots serve as uh, controls for our co-IP experiment. So here we used these um, lysates from these uh, transfection, uh, transfected cells, and we performed IP using anti-V5 and then blotted with anti flag Now let's compare lane one with lane two. And this comparison shows that the R620W step does not alter the interaction between PTPN22 and UVH3A. Now let's compare lane three with lane four. And again, uh, this comparison shows that the R620W SNP does not affect the interaction between PDPN22 and the W279A UVH3A isoform. Now let's compare lane 1 with lane 3 and compare lane 2 with lane 4. And these two comparisons show that the W279A mutation, point mutation in the SH3 domain of UVH3A uh, indeed reduced the interaction between UVH3A and PTPN22. So this is consistent with our pull-down uh, uh, result, which showed that uh, the SH3 domain is in, uh, mediates the interaction between UVH3A and PTPN22. So these data um, show that this R620W SNP does not affect the interaction between UVH3A and PTPN22. So currently, we're still working on the question of um, which proline-rich domains of PTPN22 does the SH3 domain of UVH3A bind to. So um, genetic data and functional data, including those from our group, 
have shown that RS112 in the UBASH3A gene con um, contributes to risk for type 1 diabetes. And so does the RC, uh, RS247 SNP in the PDPN22 gene. Next, we ask the question, is there genetic interaction between these two SNPs? Do these two SNPs exert a joint effect on risk for T1D? So to answer these questions, we perform the genetic association tests, examining the effect of the interaction term between the two SNPs on risk for T1D. And we use the data from more than 10,000 individuals from over 2,600 T1D affected sibling pairs and trio families of the European ancestry. These individuals were ascertained by the type 1 diabetes genetics consortium. And we use the two different um, statistical programs to do this uh, test. Uh, these two programs are called the MDR-PDT test and the unfazed test. And as we can see here, both of the uh, statistical program, programs um, detected a significant p-value for the interaction term between the two SNPs on the risk for T1D. So this suggests that there is genetic interaction between RS112 and RS247. And these two SNPs jointly affect risk for type 1 diabetes. To summarize this second part of my talk, we have uncovered novel interactions, including both biochemical interaction and the statistical interaction between UBASH3A and PDPN22, which are two different um, shared risk factors for multiple autoimmune diseases. And these results were published in the journal IJMS in May this year. In the final part of my talk, I'll share with you our ongoing translational project in the lab. So based on the mechanistic insights we have gained on UBASH3A, we are now developing novel UBASH3 inhibitors. As I have mentioned, UBASH3 inhibits IL-2 production. So we hypothesized that our UBASH3 inhibitors might be able to correct the aberration of low IL-2 levels in some patients with autoimmune diseases. Furthermore, uh, IL-2 affects, um, contributes to multiple diseases, not just autoimmune diseases. In fact, IL-2 has been being developed in clinical trials as a new therapy for transplant rejection, autoimmune diseases, cancer, and infection. So this suggests that our UBASH3 inhibitors might also be used to treat these diseases, as shown here. Our basic studies have um, established the functions and significance of the UBA domain and the SH3 domain of UBASH3A. As I mentioned earlier, uh, UBASH3A can be ubiquitinated, and the K202 site is the major ubiquitination site on UBASH3A. So when UBASH3A is mono-ubiquitinated, it loses its function as a result of adopt, uh, adopting a closed confirmation. So based on these pieces of information, we have been collaborating with Dr. Jianping Ling's group at Nankai University and together, we aim to identify small molecule compounds that can bind to these target sites on UBASH3A, as indicated by the green stars here on this plot. So we have successfully completed a large scale uh, in silico drug screening. So in total, we have screened more than 1.7 million small molecule compounds using a uh, predicted UBASH3A structure, uh, predicted by AlphaFold because the actual um, structure of human protein, uh, human UH3A protein has not yet been solved. We performed molecular docking and ran the ADMET algorithm, which can predict the solubility and permeability of a small molecule compound. We also conducted visual inspection, and now we have 50 top-ranked uh, small molecule compounds. And currently, we're studying these compounds in the lab using uh, both cell-based assays and uh, mouse studies. 
So in addition, we have been working on the expression and purification of human full-length UBH3A protein. So this new resource um, will allow us to study, to solve the structure the, of the complex formed by the UBH3A protein with our candidate drug. And we are doing this project in collaboration with our um, uh, protein production core at the ICGED China Regional Research Center. In addition, we have generated a new UBH3A conditional knockout mouse, which can serve as another useful tool in our drug development work. Now let me summarize the entire talk. So I have discussed the uh, several major challenges in the field of autoimmune diseases. And I have shown our findings um, related to these major challenges. We have elucidated the mechanisms whereby UBH3A and its genetic risk, its genetic variants um, affect uh, T cell function and risk for autoimmune diseases in humans. We have also uncovered uh, novel interactions between UBH3A and PDPN22, which are two important shared risk factors for autoimmune diseases. Our findings have a broad impact. So our studies have uh, provided new insights into the mechanism of complex diseases involving many risk factors, uh, such as autoimmune disease. Our findings have revealed potential new drug targets, as well as key biological pathways underlying autoimmunity. Furthermore, our findings can facilitate future IL-2 clinical trials, not only for autoimmune diseases, but also for cancer, infection, and transplantation. And that's all for today. And thank you very much for your attention. And here is my email address. And I um, welcome you to contact me after the seminar. And thank you. And now I'm happy to take questions.